in the, about the 30 minutes or so that I have, I'd like to talk a little bit about this concept of talking about an edgy revolution. Um, I'll lead in a little bit. Uh, the, uh, Youssef did a wonderful job with the introduction, so you know a little bit about myself. Uh, but I'll spend more kind of time <clears throat> talking about the current climate as it pertains to youth of color in general and black students in particular and what's needed to help remedy those situations. So uh, I began by, uh, with a story about uh, one of my favorite individuals who is Dr. Martin Luther King. As we know, as years pass, it becomes increasingly more convenient to quote Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. It's, it's in vogue at this point to pluck one of his sayings sort of devoid of context and then use it as a standard of measurement uh, for struggles of justice. Uh, even those who would likely be his political opponents in contemporary times uh, find a way to get mileage out of uh, words specific, spe specifically out of the I Have a Dream speech. He's become, in my opinion, <clears throat> and this is somebody who you know, really loves King, I think a caricature of himself. Uh, Dr. King's image, I think, has been watered down uh, and reduced to sound bites. Uh, but what ought not be lost uh, about Dr. King is that he truly was a revolutionary. <clears throat> he had a revolutionary side, and he was a disruptive force for positive change. Uh, of all his many speeches and sermons and, and writings and interviews, the one that surfaces for me right now is a message titled, Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution, 1968. Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution. This one is particularly poignant because he makes reference to the story about Rip Van Winkle. Are y'all familiar with this story? Um, I remember hearing it as a kid. <clears throat> but as the story goes, and I'm zipping through this, uh, Rip Van Winkle goes up to a mountain and then falls asleep and that deep sleep lasts for 20 whole years, okay? Uh, so he's been asleep for two decades and then he suddenly wakes up and when Rip Van, when Van Winkle w wakes up, he wakes up to an entirely different world altogether than the one he went to sleep in. He awakens uh, to find that things have changed pretty drastically and Dr. King focuses on this particular part. When Rip Van Winkle wakes up, uh, from his sleep on the side of the mountain, or rather when he goes to sleep, there's a picture of King George III of England. When he lays his head down. When he wakes up, when he arises from his slumber, there is a picture of George Washington. And that's symbolic because Rip Van Winkle slept through a revolution. He slept through the American Revolution. Dr. King says, and I quote, all too many people find themselves living amid a great period of social change, and yet they fail to develop the new attitudes, the new mental response, the new situation demands, and they end up sleeping through a revolution. Now he goes on to use this as a frame to talk about the issues of the 1960s. <clears throat> but I'd like to borrow his frame for a moment to encourage us not to sleep through a revolution but I'm talking about an edgy revolution. Um, I would submit that given the challenges we find ourselves in socially, politically, in our present atmosphere and age, that we stand in need of a revolution as well. And when I say that, what I mean is a radical change of circumstance, particularly in our education system, uh, and particularly as it concerns uh, students of color. Now, I realize this is an African-American event primarily, and so I will focus particularly on our group uh, of African-Americans. but. Many of the things that I'm mentioning apply to uh, other groups of color as well, from Latinx folks to Native folks, uh, to segments of Asian populations as well. Uh, it's incumbent upon us at this moment in time not to fall asleep at the wheel. Um, I, I use as a, a personal experience of mine a story to sort of illustrate why I think that this is the case, okay? Uh, while speaking to a group of African-American young men at a high school, uh, which will remain nameless, uh, about habits of success and overcoming obstacles, um, I made mention of the fact that as a people of darker hue, that they will have to endure challenges that their white counterparts will often never have to endure. I spoke to the rampant inequities that exist within the school system uh, with black boys being suspended at more than four times the rate of their peers in North Carolina and six times for black girls. 
as well as other broader societal changes uh, to which we grow, we, we're going to have to grow accustomed to and adapt. As I close the session, uh, the students seem to really appreciate that sort of straight talk uh, from somebody who looked like them. They told me as much as they, uh, as we exchanged greetings and as they edited, that they, you know, they were appreciative of that. But there was one of the teachers who um, I, I don't think uh, was, was as fond. Um, she pulled me aside uh, as a result of, of the speech. And she happened to be a white woman. And, and she pulled me aside and began to very respectfully ask me why I felt the need to pull the race card with these kids. She went on to say that she felt like in that context, it was highly inappropriate. Um, and that she as an instructor at said school, which is a majority black school, um, she tries to tell her students that they can be whatever they want, so long as they uh, work hard. They can do whatever they choose to. And um, that she doesn't see race. And that, you know, have, if she did see race, clearly, you know, she wouldn't be working at the school, right? Um, I replied that as, as much as I would love for that to be true, <laughs> sincerely, that it was my job and furthermore the job of educators to confront the harsh realities of this society as they currently are. And that while uh, I certainly know that these young men uh, possess all the ability and all the aptitude to be great, um, to not talk about racism as a barrier, uh, it constitutes a dereliction of duty on the part of educators that we have to prepare them to navigate this world as it currently exists in the hopes that they can create the world that we want to see. Uh, we agreed to disagree <laughs> and parted our ways, but I, uh, my position remains the same. Um, that's pretty much my outlook. It, I think it's wildly irresponsible to approach teaching and learning in a way that ignores the intersections of race and education. Um, as Carter G. Woodson makes the case in his classic text, The Miseducation of the Negro, these things must be viewed within their historical setting. You can't simply tear things out of the pages of the past without uh, supplying them with some sort of context. When doing this, it's apparent that race has always interacted with education. This is not a conclusion that we're forming based upon current Circumstance. Historically, that's always been the case. Race and education have always been hand in hand and determined much as far as access to it as well as quality of it. It is clear that the power of education has always been readily acknowledged by power structures of our country. As the Greek slave turned Epictetus once stated, only the educated are free. This explains why, then, the institution of slavery flourished in America because it was unlawful to teach enslaved Africans how to read according to the slave codes. Consider the justification used in North Carolina's General Assembly and the statute from 1831, one of their slave codes, where it's, it, it provides justification by saying, whereas, this is a quote, whereas the teaching of slaves to read and write has a tendency to excite dissatisfaction in their minds mm -hmm. and to produce insurrection and rebellions to the manifest injury of the citizens of this state, end quote. Clearly the power of education is buried even if it's done in sort of a dubious way. In North Carolina, violating such a law was punishable by imprisonment, by hard labor, or up to 39 lashes, if you can imagine. Despite this, the descendants of kidnapped and enslaved Africans still had a reverence, still had an appetite for learning and pursued it with reckless abandonment despite the consequences. After emancipation, despite there being no true public education system as we understand it today, uh, through the Freedmen's Bureau, black folks were, its, were in hot pursuit of, of this notion of education. So much so that uh, renowned black sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois credits freed blacks and carpetbagging whites as those responsible for setting up the first true public education system. And I want to pause here for a moment to uh, acknowledge a friend of mine and somebody who if you don't know, you should probably take some, op some opportunity to learn, Ann McCall. Ann McCall is a local education attorney who's been around for a long time, but she does tremendous work uh, excavating and uh, digging up the archives of North Carolina Constitution formation. She looks at, in context, uh, 
how North Carolina's constitution was formed, all of the uh, political nuances of the time, and you see a major artery of that is how they legislate around education. That's a huge part of that. So if you have the opportunity to hear Emma Cross speak or do her other presentation, 1956, which talks about how North Carolina responded to Brown versus Board of Education, please take the opportunity to do that. But even after the Freedmen's Bureau, deep into Jim Crow segregation, even then, African Americans have valued the promise of education, uh, even if they had their access to it being constrained deliberately and under-resourced and treated unequally. And that runs counter to the narratives that we hear um, when, when people talk about the culture uh, of African Americans, particularly as it pertains to education, because what we hear is that there's sort of a pathology, right? That uh, there's a culture that just doesn't value that. But, you know, if there was any ever a time to be discouraged about our prospects, I think it would have been <laughs> during, those, during those times. And so these are oftentimes the stories that we don't lift up, but they're crucially important. So even in segregation, nonetheless, the interesting thing about that false market of segregation is that it actually created a pipeline where the best and the brightest black teaching talent was forced to be in the classroom as instructors, naturally because you, can't, you, don't have the, you don't have the full suite of options to pursue other careers and so forth. And what that created was a, a, a cohort of black teachers who were incredibly skilled, who were able to uh, engage and, and deliberate and critique and build up other population in ways that heretofore just hadn't been experienced. Um, they conveyed important knowledge about how to survive in an overtly racist society of that time. Even after the victory of Brown versus Board of Education, um, it's interesting because we talk about uh, desegregation at, oftentimes as if it's this thing that went off without a hitch, and we know, I mean, when you see the stories, uh, you know, I live in Charlotte, and you see what happened to Dorothy Collins in 57, or uh, you know, Little Rock, or wherever else, that it didn't go off without a hitch, that oftentimes it was black students who ended up bearing the brunt of integration. Even then, though, race would prove significant, because as Bell Hooks, uh, radical black feminist and educator, mentions in her text, Teaching to Transgress, she recalls her experience growing up in the South in, in segregated schools, under the tutelage of phenomenal black educators. She says that those educators viewed teaching as a political act. That by teaching them how to think, how to be intelligent, how to uh, counter the narrative and the stereotypes, that that was a deliberately anti-racist thing to do. And that they were aware of that. And then she talks about the contrast and being a part of integration efforts where she then had to go to schools uh, with primarily white teachers in that environment who didn't possess the same approach to learning and how it caused her to lose interest because it had no connection to her lived experience. Um, recently, I don't know if you all heard this podcast from Malcolm Gladwell. Um, Malcolm Gladwell is a renowned author, but he talks about in his podcast, Revisionist History, um, the little known stories about the massive loss of black teachers that happened as a result of Brown versus Board. And what he says is that uh, although they may, America may have uh, integrated the student populations, if you want to use the term integration, what we failed to do was integrate the teaching force. So that as many of these districts consolidated, those scores of black teachers that I mentioned before were never absorbed into the districts. In fact, there were massive layoffs, whole cloth. Districts were outright refusing to hire those black teachers. So you have to imagine all of, the, all of the teaching talent that leaked out of that pipeline in that one seminal moment. And that consequently is, consequently is the history of why we say, where are all the black teachers at? Well, there's a story behind that. But I say all that to say is that in this way, when we look at history, once again, race is significant. Um, we just don't have the luxury of not talking about it. So and now, presently, 60 plus years after the landmark court case, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that when we look at how race shows up currently, ra uh, schools are once again resegregated by race and by income, which is different than last time, and that we have a school to prison pipeline that has developed where racial disparities in discipline have, have translated to increased contact with the criminal justice system. Racial inequities are pronounced and 
as persistent today as they've ever been. For many students of color in general, and black students in particular, school has become a place of oppression and a site where historical traumas are resurfaced. Consider the words of ta Coates in his book, Between the World and Me. How many of y'all have read that book? That book is great, but this particular phrase stuck out to me as an educator because he takes the schools to task here. And he says, I quote, I came to see the streets and the schools as arms of the same beast. One enjoyed the official power of the state while the other enjoyed its implicit sanction. But fear and violence were the weaponry of both. Fail in the streets and the crews would catch you slipping and take your body. Fail in the schools and you would be suspended and sent back to those same streets where they would take your body. As I began to see these two arms in relation, those who failed in the schools justified their destruction in the streets. Society could say, he should have stayed in school and then washed their hands of him. What Coates is doing here is what I think educators and advocates of education can ill afford not to do. <laughs> and that's that he's applying a level of systems thinking. He understands that the education system is but one in an interrelated web of systems and that it does not exist in a vacuum all by itself. This is a crucial point that the teacher I spoke about I think was missing and failed to understand and also many of us educators fail to understand as well. By no fault of our own, I don't think. Um, I hate to lay everything at the feet of teachers, but it just, we're not properly uh, equipped to deal with the situations as they currently stand. Racially disparate outcomes can be seen in just about every major institution that you can think of. The institutional racism and white supremacy are systemic threads, systemic threads woven into the social fabric. They're not mere one-offs or individual instances or acts of meanness. They are systemic in nature. There's a sentencing gap where black males receive sentences 20% longer than similarly situated whites in the criminal justice system, according to a study just released recently by the uh, Sentencing Commission. There's a wage gap where blacks are paid less for doing the same jobs even when they have the same credentials. As a consequence, there is a racial wealth gap mm -hmm. <laughs> with the average white household uh, wealth being more than seven times that of black households. And the average, and, and rather, in the median household, wealth being 12 times higher. There's research that shows job applicants are less likely to get callbacks if they have black sounding names. They're more, more likely to be targeted <clears throat> for subprime mortgages and loans, even if their income and credit is higher than their white counterparts. Even minuscule things that we don't even think about that seem uh, unimportant like how much pain medication is administered when one goes to the hospital and emergency room. There are racial demarcations as to how much pain medicine black people get. From healthcare to housing to jobs to criminal justice to finance to education, racialized outcomes are part of the system. And to quote the author David Stroh, uh, who wrote the book Systems Thinking for Social Change, Every system is designed to achieve whatever it's accomplishing. Think about that for a moment. Every system is designed to achieve whatever it's accomplishing. Whether it's on purpose or not, it's either a design flaw or it is a design feature. But it's in the design. So how do we fix it? We need a revolution. And I'm talking about an edgy revolution. We need a radical change in our approach to education because, to quote one of my favorite rap groups, De La Soul, stakes is high. <laughs> the reason why we can't sleep through this edgy revolution is because perhaps more than ever, the ability to gain access to a quality education will have a dramatic bearing on the opp opportunity structure for our youth. Whereas education is not a cure for racism, we tend to say things those who really believe in education, because we love it, we say education is the great equalizer. And, and, and although I wish it was so, that's not true. It, it unfortunately is not true. But to be very clear, for black folk in particular, we yield greater returns when we do have it. So for us, it's particularly poignant for us to have education. 
But conversely, you ought to think about what are the consequences if we don't. It impacts our social and our economic mobility. In 2014, renowned economist Raz Chetty and his colleagues released a report called Where is the Land of Opportunity? Measuring the upward mobility of the 50 largest cities in America. And some of y'all probably heard about the study because we've been talking about it in Charlotte until we're blue in the face. What he found is that the absolute, uh, absolute rather, uh, upward mobility of the 50 largest cities, that out of those 50 largest that Charlotte ranked dead last. It was a surprise to Charlottean student. Because, <laughs> you know, when you look at all of the, you know, the banking hub and, you know, all of the new construction, we were really surprised. But you know what? Raleigh was ranked number 48th. The whole southeastern region, you, the heat map that's provided in the study is red hot. Right? So it's, it's a regional problem, right? And when you talk about economic mobility, you're talking about you break the population up into quintiles. Okay, so you break them up into fifths. Your lowest quintile, so that is your most underprivileged group, right? Your working poor, your underclass, have the least ability to move from the bottom to the top in Charlotte than anywhere else in the country. So that if you are born into poverty, you are more likely to remain in poverty throughout, throughout the duration of your life. In that way, social and economic uh, mobility, or lack thereof, almost determines your life chances. And it's interesting because the five major factors that correlate with economic mobility in that study are segregation, residential segregation. We all know the history of how that came about, right? We like to think that neighborhoods naturally evolve and that, you know, people are tribal, and maybe to an extent, right? Um, but the truth of the matter is there's a long, you know, five-decade history of housing discrimination, of redlining, of blockbusting, of, of housing policy that deliberately created and ghettoized communities by undervaluing them based upon uh, the population density of people of color. Right, so that that's very much a, a design uh, for an impoverished uh, neighborhood. But that, that legacy lives on today, right? That we still see that. And so areas where you have high residential segregation, um, where there's racial and economic segregation, that impacts economic opportunity. Uh, income inequality. So that is places where you don't have a thriving, robust middle class, where there's a small, concentrated few at the top who have a lot, and then you have just whole swaths of populations who are making, uh, you know, barely even, if, if even, a uh, livable wage, that that consequently impacts economic mobility, okay? So what you have as a result of that is that you've howled out the middle class and folks can't move up because there's nobody to occupy those positions. And then school quality goes without saying, what happens at the school determines your fate as well. Uh, social capital and family structure. It's important to talk about the world of school quality in this because that experience will help determine life chances, life chances for children. I want to pause here because uh, family formation um, is, is, is something we tend to gloss over, but one thing I, I want to I state is that uh, it should go without saying that parents have a responsibility to instill the values of learning and of discipline and of respect in their children. While we talk about systems and how systems constrain opportunities, uh, Truth is, there's a segment of us who, who ain't getting the job done, too, right? And that we have to be accountable for that. That is, that is our responsibility. I'm as much a proponent for personal responsibility as everybody else. But when that system doesn't permit those in the margins to really be successful, there's not enough personal responsibility in the world to offset that, okay? So we have to make sure we're dealing with that. Uh, this concept of a new... Uh, idea of education is predicated on racial equity that, that is race conscious and it focuses on three things pedagogy processes and policies I'll start with pedagogy because I didn't read a lot of education stuff I came from you know, education for me is a different it's the second act of a career I came from working directly with youth in that school setting and as a truancy officer as you heard and so in that environment just being real and honest and building relationships is the capital. I had to learn all the other stuff. But what I found is that that real honesty, that confrontation about what they're up against and being honest, 
Does that extend to level of capital with young people? So the, I, would be, I would begin every class, every, every course, first day of school, by telling them effectively what I told you, that the education system is essentially a setup, <laughs> right? And they look at me like, is you supposed to be saying this, right? <laughs> but what I would do is I would say, now that you know that, if we work in tandem, I would like for us to find ways to confront the system. And I think that you will allow me, together we can find ways to disrupt that. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I stumbled into this. I didn't know there was a label to this approach that is called critical pedagogy. It was a student who put pedagogy of the oppressed in my hands. And said, hey, Mr. Ford, have you ever read this? I had never been exposed to Paulo Freire's writings. I didn't know that there was an approach to education where um, you were expected to co-investigate societal problems with students in the world that they exist in. That, that stuff had never passed in my hands in teacher preparation. I never had uh, the, 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 the concept or, or idea of education as a practice of freedom implanted in my mind. I, I never had been exposed to researchers like Sonia Nieto, Pedro Nogueira, Gloria Ladson Billings, and Chance Lewis. Okay? So those are the sorts of things that there's no excuse for. There should be nobody who steps into or in front of children of color in particular who has not read Paulo Freire, who has not read The Miseducation of the Negro. These are things that have to be a part of pre-service and in-service teaching in order to shift pedagogy. Second is processes. Our routines and the decisions we make have to be scrutinized. We have to evaluate the systems and apply systems thinking because there's a reason why black students are overrepresented in special education and underrepresented in academically and intellectually gifted. That's, that's not about aptitude, okay? Because even when students of color score high on benchmark assessments, they're still not promoted into these courses or referred at the same rate as many white students of whom don't score as highly. So what that says is there's a systems problem here where there are discretionary decisions that are being made. Even with suspensions, discretionary infractions, those that are our judgment call, are where those disparities tend to lie because oftentimes the same offenses, um, and this is the work of Russell Skiba, that uh, black and whites, when they do the same uh, offenses, those that are really kind of gray, like disrespect, insubordination, aggressive behavior, that that is where your disparities lie. And so unless we edit system, uh, audit systems and ensure that there is parity in the decisions and the processes that we have, we'll continue to see the same outcomes. And lastly, policy. So much of what we see is structural. There has been a move toward colorblind approaches to education, and guess what? It has given us color-coded outcomes because we have diminished the significance of race. We have attempted to paper over things and assume that race is merely skin color, and it's not. It's, it denotes culture, it denotes a certain lived experience, it denotes certain behavior. Geneva Gay said there's no such thing as culturally neutral teaching. The way that you talk, walk, eat, speak, all that stuff is, is, is laden with culture. And so, as Eduardo Bonilla Silva says, if you don't account for these things in the policies that we make, right? if we're not deliberate about it, it's wrote a piece about recruiting teachers of color. If we're not deliberate about targeting certain populations, then it constitutes what, uh, what Bonilla Silva calls a sort of colorblind racism, which just reinforces the hierarchy without us doing anything. It's racism without racism. And I don't know everything, y'all. Yeah, I want to leave by saying that. I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. What I can tell you is that in all of my work from, from here to my demise, uh, I will make it my explicit purpose to pursue the answers to these profound questions in order to find ways to improve outcomes for students of color with every fiber in my being. And I would hope that we would do the same because our literal democracy depends on our ability to take care of even the least of these and ensure that everybody has not the same thing, but everybody has what they need.